All right, so I am deeply honored to introduce some friends here. Um, we have Daniel Eilenberg, who is heading up Little Heroes. We have Michael Baptiste from Christie's. And this is the man who I call when I need advice on buying stuff that I can't afford. <laughs> Mitch Lexamana, who is going to be hosting this one for me. And the one and only Edgar Plans. Now, Edgar, I've been collecting Edgar's physical work for years. Um, I've been lucky enough to buy his works on secondary because I've never managed to get them at the primary market. They've cost me a fortune and they are worth every penny because they're amazing. Edgar touches on emotions in his work that it's truly unique, the work he does. And it's very, very, very special. Um, and now we have the advent of one, Little Heroes, that came out and minted out immediately. And soon, we're going to get Little Villains. I'm not going to touch too much on any of this stuff, because I'm going to leave it to Mitch to uncover. Um, but uh, over to you guys. Sir, that was some alpha. Did you say Little Villains? Little Villains. I said nothing. Uh, I said nothing. He, he said nothing. I heard it. Well, uh, yeah, I heard it too. That's what I'm saying. Maybe we'll leave it to Daniel to tell us about uh, Little Villains. Um, but first, I, I, I'd, I'd love to hear, like, what brought you into NFTs? I mean, what brought you to, to bring little heroes into the NFT space? Um, what inspired that? Translate, please. Um, is, is operative? Um, sorry, I don't speak very well English. Uh, I have my English very rusty. I'm going to speak sometimes in Spanish. Um, my partner is going to translate. Okay? okay? Sounds great. Cool. Yeah. Perfecto. Uh, this character started to paint uh, maybe 10 years ago um, with the philosophy or my idea to, to, to put in, 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 each, in each hero uh, social uh, powers that the society, actual or contemporary society has lost in like solidarity, like um, uh, fight against the environment problems. Um, and this kind of superpowers is, is that we need in this society actually. And these uh, little animals uh, appear uh, with this kind of superpowers, uh, one night, for example, uh, start the story. In one night in my city, uh, some animals like mouses, uh, dogs, and cats uh, was was uh, looking for food in the container, in the in the trash, and appeared some alien and put some some superpowers in these animals, and then. Is the uh, the reason that my uh, my character I are like a small mouses, a small uh, dogs, or a small animals, or or una mezcla, a mix, a mix uh, mouse and cats, uh, and this is the the first idea of the this kind of, of characters. So this is a like uh, incredibly um, popular series of, of characters that you've developed over time. And I love that you're here, right? So you mm -hmm. can give us a sense of, yep. you know, what does it mean to preserve the, the art form in, in its pure physical form now moving into the realm of NFTs? Well, what it, maybe we, we can even take a, uh, a step back and describe what yeah, it is yeah, that you do yeah. at Christie's well, and, let, let, I, I'm and how you think I'm primarily a physical art specialist, contemporary okay. art specialist. Uh, I work in our office here in New York. And last year, actually, was the first time that I saw one of Edgar's paintings at Christie's. And I had heard his name, and I had seen his art online. But working at an auction house, which is a secondary market, resale market, essentially, I hadn't seen them in person. It was actually in an auction that um, Ronnie, Pierovino, Ronnie Pierovino co-curated with my colleague, Lindsey Griffith, who's in the audience. Uh, Ronnie's big in the NFT community and in the physical art community. And I loved Edgar's work when we had it on the wall. It was about $20,000 was the estimate. It was a painting that was probably 30 inches square. And it sold for under uh, over $100,000. I think it actually made a record at the time. It was about $150,000. And I was astounded to see that the 
the people who were bidding on it were all over the world. Uh, a lot of bidding from Asia, from the United States. Do you and not from usually Europe. see that? Often artists will have um, a bidding pool or collector base that's regional, you know? And Ed Edgar's collector base originally was from Spain. Um, but since he's blown up, in particular in Asia, um, we see people bidding from all over the world, and it's a very healthy sign. Uh, so that's, so how, I, that's how I, I got introduced is because to Just to give you some context, I know very little about the physical art scene, more no, so I don't about believe NFTs. It. I don't believe right? it. No, no, I, I'm... Couldn't be, couldn't be more serious. Uh, I, I, pr I hold way more JPEGs than I do actual <laughs> art hanging on my wall. Um, and that's why, like, what's cool about the NFT space is that anyone can purchase your art. Anyone can mint. It, it doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how much uh, money you have, though, uh, unless you have at least 0.4 Ethereum, right? You could not uh -huh. mint a little hero. <laughs> so were you, did you have exposure to the little heroes drop? Uh, that was your first uh, exposure to Edgar? So that, that was first exposure to physical. Okay. Um, I've worked with a few pieces since then. Um, and then, of course, I, I followed the drop. Um, and how, know, do, how do we do? Well. Yeah. <laughs> were you able to mint? No. Oh, no. no, no. Too slow. I'm always too slow. NGMI. Uh, yeah. I, uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really impressed by the project. I think it's astounding. I think the story around it is astounding. Um, and I love to see when really talented and well-developed uh, physical artists enter the NFT space. And it's not easy to do it um, well. Uh, Edgar's obviously done it well. And uh, I, I love the idea. I mean, I, th I put him in a group of, uh, in a select group of, of well-known physical artists who are in the space. And I think that speaks volumes on, like, from, from your standpoint, being a traditional, from Christie's, fiscal art. Wearing, and, a, wearing a suit. <laughs> yeah, wearing, wearing a, a nice suit, might I add. Um, your vantage point in POV and in the market, you Christie's was one of the first to really be NFT yep. like forward. My colleague Noah, yep, yeah. Beeble. We, I was just saying, it was only March of last year. It's crazy. Yeah. It seems like 10 years ago. I still remember when that still happened. When so we were all I. talking about Clubhouse was still a thing. It, we were talking about yeah. Clubhouse. Yeah, I was in my girlfriend's bedroom and we thought it would make a million dollars. And that was a colleague of yours. Yeah, no, no Davis, yeah. He's actually just left Christie's to work for with CryptoPunks. Interesting. Uh, maybe we'll circle back to you later on <laughs> if that is a, a trend that we'll be seeing. But um, little villains, little villains. Maybe we could shed some light on that. So Little Heroes was a, an awesome collection. You guys launched, released, I believe, I, w I wanna say it was like sometime um, last year, right? A little bit last year? Okay, January this year. Wow, that's still years, years ago. Yeah, years ago, right? Um, in the NFT space, it's years. Um, when you guys launched, I mean, there was so much like hype and excitement around uh, an artist like yourself coming into the NFT space because it legitimizes our our space f like further, this technology further. It also expands the the audience space um, and brings um, you know Edgar's like traditional collectors into the NFT scene. Um, what has your experience been since um, with providing utility, with interacting with your community, with building it, and can you share more on what the, the future holds with Lil Villains? Yeah, of course. So, you know, the, I would first say that, is this, yeah. can you guys hear me well? Um, the experience was phenomenal, launching the project, working with Edgar on getting it ready, building out the community, um, you know, we, we actually came from the entertainment and media world, and the way that the project started was, you know, initially, I think, September 2020, I emailed Edgar, uh, this one? Um, oh, it's better. I emailed Edgar as a fan, telling him how much I loved his characters and his paintings, and I wanted to turn it into an animated series. Um, and that's how we started. Uh, discussing and then sort of shaping what Little Heroes would, would become. But the origin of the, of the project was always, and the intention was always to build an entertainment franchise. And as we were developing the project, it was all throughout last year, everyone here knows just how prominent the NFT space became, um, how sort of wider the adoption of NFTs you know, came last year. And it seemed like 
the perfect project and the perfect partner to launch into that space. And so that's, that's how we sort of came uh, into the space. And I think for us what's really fascinating and interesting about it is sort of it's something that's really sort of pulled together the world of technology, the world of entertainment, the world of art, um, and soon to be, you know, the worlds of merch and music and so on into a single project. And the ability to build a brand, mm. to establish the IP, to create a group of super fans that are vested in the project, we found that it's unrivaled in the NFT space versus somewhere else. Um, and today we have, you know, an, an IP that is relatively well established with a healthy business around it and that allows us to now build this vision of building out a franchise in a very different way than how traditional studios build that out. Um, uh, and, you know, just to go into that a little bit, if you, if you think about sort of how Hollywood creates projects today, right? Hollywood is fantastic at identifying IP outside of its ecosystem and developing and turning it into entertainment franchise. If you think about you know, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, Tiger King, any of these things that start as books, as novels, as podcasts, and so on. But, but very few studios, maybe other than Pixar and, and Disney, of course, for a very long time, have been able to really incubate IP that they create themselves. Um, and so for us, uh, as a media and entertainment company, this has been a real game changer. Um, and the experience has been great, of course, managing a large community, delivering on the roadmap. It's, it's great, it comes with certain challenges, but it's, you know, it's, a, it's a goal and an ambition and something that you know, we're very excited uh, to meet. And to actually answer your question about Little Villains. <laughs> um, so, you know, Little Villains, the, the, the initial idea came from a couple of things. Number one is we wanted to give a you know, a reward to our holders, to the people that minted the project, and so we came up with the idea of launching the next collection and giving it free to the holders of Little Heroes. Um, and as we thought about an entertainment franchise, we were also thinking about expanding that universe, right? We created the heroes. You need the villains for this to, you know, for, for the heroes to have a job. Um, and, so, and so that's sort of how the idea of Little Villains came about. Um, but as we think about it, you know, something that is that has become very clear to us is, you know, supply matters in this world and utility matters in this world. And so we've really been working on thinking about the utility of little villains um, and, and sort of how do we manage the supply of these things. And so what you will see when we launch little villains is little villains will be the key to what we call our training camp. Um, and our training camp is essentially a way of getting additional rewards on top of the rewards. Is it like a gamification? <clears throat> would, would, would we have it to will, stake the NFTs? Uh, yes, and, and we are sort of very intentionally sort of moving away from the word staking because it's not about yield and it's not about interest and it's not about sort of financializing the assets, um, but more about gamifying the ecosystem, right? And so you will be able to basically stake your little villain and your little hero and earn additional rewards from what you learn just holding one or the other. Beautiful, what, what might one of these rewards be exactly? Um, so, <laughs> so, you know, some of them will be um, uh, physical things. It might be that if you have a high number of, of stake little heroes and little villains, you'll get uh, access to exclusive merch, mm -hmm. maybe some you know signed items, maybe you know some really special uh, things. We're also thinking, for example, we're holding an event tonight, and we hope it's the first of many. Depending on how many heroes you have staked, you'll get a different level of tickets and access to that event. Um, but also, we're working on something that I think will be incredibly innovative, which is the ability to actually transform and earn rare, rare traits for your NFT, so you'll be able to evolve your NFTs with the rewards that you'll get out of staking them. Will the, okay, there's a lot to unpack here. So I, I wanna, <laughs> let's, let's, let's take a macro pullback, right? So yeah. media, you wanna, it sounds like Little Heroes is going to be uh, an expansion in terms of 
the IP, right? So you mentioned bringing it into other forms of entertainment. Correct. Do you have um, concurrently uh, or in conversations with like the production of uh, an animated series? Is there a video 100%. game coming out right now? Oh, there is. Absolutely. So we are, um, you know, hopefully in final negotiations now with a showrunner that will bring on board to develop the uh, the TV show. Uh, really well established uh, showrunner in Hollywood. Um, and the idea is as soon as we bring them in, uh, as soon as we bring him in, we, we're going to open basically a virtual writer's room where our holders will be able to participate of that development process because we don't want to just innovate in the way IP is created and established and exploited, um, but also in the way that it's developed. Again, if you think about the traditional Hollywood system, yes. things are sort of developed in an ivory tower behind the wall and you don't really get to enjoy these things or see that process until it's finished and released and ready for the public. And that's how always Hollywood has, has worked. And we want to turn that on its head a little bit and really bring our community into the process and make them part of that development of the show. So it'll be a, a collaborative experience with your holders. 100%. Cool. So I might be a holder and I might say, hey, I want the story to go this way. And there will be some sort of review process. Yeah, and they'll be voting so that, you know, be, look, the reality is you can't write a show with 3,000 people writing different pieces of it, right? Um, but you can make it participatory and you can give people sort of the, the kind of choices that you would get in a choose your own adventure type show where people will be part of the decisions of how the narrative develops, the characters that we introduce, what happens with those characters, the decisions that they make, uh, and we want to make all of that really participatory. What does it look like from Edgar's perspective, right, with the, with the creative development process? Um, does, it, it, does he have full creative control over every form of this IP? Um, how you guys branch it out? Like, can you tell me more about that, Edgar? Yo digo algo? Yo te digo this part of the of the process uh, I think is better Daniel to explain because sure, sure. Uh, I I try to to translate uh, physical art in digi di digital art but this this process is Danny the expert to explain I usually do all my work in my studio, like traditional process, pencils, drawings, canvas, paints. Mm. But I want to, to keep or uh, to continue making this kind of words and translating in digital. Mm. But it's very important to, to, to all the holders to see that this is a, an artist and a digital art. Mm. Uh, is this kind is maybe one way for for the artist because sometimes I was investigating uh, about NFTs, uh, NFT creators, mm. and a lot of NFTs creators is uh, don't no 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 son artistas. They're not artists? No, artists are designers, oh, I see. are illustrators, are in, uh, um, are designers, no artists. Um, I think it's uh, a new way for 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 a start to to do a different art for for more people to para llegar a más gente to reach a wider audience. That's amazing. Um, and I want to ask about your physical art because I think that's important, right? The, uh, you know, one of my best friends here, Meg Thorpe, who have, I've had the the presence of, or, or the, the I've, I've had the pleasure of, you know, not only being friends with her but also experiencing um, her sort of like evolution into the NFT space, coming first as a traditional artist, uh, physical art, and then coming into the NFT space, both marketing yourself as an artist in the NFT space, and that, and then becoming one of the biggest DJs that I know. But before all that, like. How, how did you concept your physical art moving into the NFT space? And I mean, maybe that's even a question for you, right? If you could solve it. No, it's that's not, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I will say it's way. like, it's perfectly formed in a way in that 
he has these characters. He's mm -hmm. developed these characters. Um, there's a variety of them. That's not taken. That's not to be granted for any artist. I mean, a lot of artists don't even work in a um, in a descriptive or or it, they work abstractly. I, I can't see an abstract artist entering the NFT space. So in a way, he was almost formed for it. Mm. Yeah, I agree on that note. The characters are very much uh, PFP. Right, yeah. so it's sort of played into where NFTs are right now. Right. Yeah. yeah. So expanding it, and the collection is it's three thousand, right? The collection size is three thousand. The collection is seven thousand. Seven thousand. No, the, the collectors. Oh, collectors. Okay, collectors. So, how did you guys come up with that number? How did you derive that supply? And I guess re in releasing Lil Villains opening up the collector size even further, the exposure to Edgar's work. Um, was this just a random number you thought of, or yeah. what, what was the, the math behind it? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'd be lying if I told you that we have a you know, hidden formula for arriving at that number. Um, but, but for us, it was really sort of thinking about striking a balance between having enough of them that you can build a sizable community around and enough of a community for this to be meaningful, um, but also understanding that you know, we are dealing with a contemporary artist, one whose work is incredibly hard to find. Um, and so we wanted to open his art to a new set of collectors. Uh, as Michael said, you know, his art is, is not only hard to find, but appreciating in value quite a bit. Uh, making it inaccessible for a lot of people. And so it was about sort of creating a series of his art that was more accessible um, with a number that was large enough to have a community but not too large that it would be oversupply. Um, and seven's a number that we like, so. I, and I think you guys found a good um, number because the, the current floor price is, is higher than mint. So that's, I mean, that's... It's positive. It it's is, positive yeah. EV, as we like to say. In this environment, it is, yeah. absolutely. So is there a distinction between, Edgar, your physical collectors and your NFT collectors, or is there a cool like dichotomy of, of both? Is there an overlap, or are these two audience like, distinct? And I want to actually loop back to you and, and what you see uh, on the Christie's I, front. Uh, I think, I think there, are, there is some overlap, um, but at least from Christie's side, a lot of the collectors who are buying his physical work are traditional art collectors who, um, who are just really, um, they love the imagery, you know? It's, it's, um, it's enjoyable to live with. Um, it seems very um, familiar, and yet it's completely his own. And what is the floor price of his physical artworks? Like, what's the cheapest entry point into Edgar's, or, or more, for, for, this, more for unique, affordable? For a unique work on paper, you'd have to spend about $20,000. And that's a, that's a small one. For a painting, you're, up, you're above $50,000. Pretty small, pretty small painting. Of one of these little heroes, but in like physical well, he, form. His work often has a lot of different characters in it. Uh, a small drawing might have one. Um, and then for larger paintings, you're, you're in six figures now. Gotcha. So that uh, price, Resale, right? resale. There's resale. Re that is right, resale. Right. And, okay. and of course, people come to the resale market because they can't buy them either uh, through a gallery or uh, from the artists themselves on the primary market. And, and the cool thing about Christie's is that we work with the biggest, best collectors in the world. And a lot of times, they simply don't know how to access the primary market. You know, it's like going to any store where if you collect records or if you collect clothes, you go to the place you know. People come to us, they see this, they've heard the name and they buy it, um, and they don't mind spending a little more and competing for it at auction. Well, that's what I'm saying is like, you know, I could go to OpenSea right now, X2Y2 looks rare, and actually pick up one of your works for a considerable, considerably like uh, more like affordable entry point. Uh, how did you guys, like does that, ups how do physical art collectors feel about the entry point on the NFT side being, you know, not as high? Um, do they care? Is that is there a contention point there? No, they don't. And anyone I think who's interested or does care will will purchase the NFTs as well. That's that's the cool thing, um, especially because the the collectors on my side are spending more for physicals. So to, it's kind of you know the price point is down, so it's easier. Um, yeah, I mean there 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 is there is crossover, but in some ways I think the collecting communities are still are still quite separate, which is natural. I mean, 
again, Beeble was only a year ago. You know, Christie's hasn't been in the NFT world all that long. Well, yeah, I mean, the NFT world hasn't been the NFT right, world exactly, all that long, right. right? So it only has been a year, that's right. Um, can you give us like a sense? Like, a, I feel like you're a good litmus test for how traditional art collectors feel about the NFT space. I mean, what are the thoughts on it? I, I, think, that the, I think that for traditional collectors to be interested um, in the NFT space, they need to have a, a foundation, a, a, an understanding of the technology. And there are some really, really smart collectors with a lot of money who don't understand anything about it. And it's like talking, you know, to your uncle or your grandparents. If they don't know, they might get, you know, a little tense. Um, but um, on the other hand, they're very serious collectors and galleries and artists who understand the potential of the technology, and therefore they've 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 gone right in. They've dove in. So that that's that's the difference. It's not a matter of uh, of values or even money in the collecting space. I think it comes down to the technology. How do you see both of these asset classes, both physical and and NFT art? I see personally from my desk. I sit back and I watch. <laughs> Do you watch? Um, are you only watching physical art, or no, do you also no, I, have to collect I, I, I NFTs too? I pay attention to both. I, I, I've um, no, I, I, I actually don't own any NFTs, but I have attempted to mint some NFTs. I just haven't, I haven't, I haven't. You know, gas has been too high or whatever. You got to get him on a DJ yeah. net soon. You got to chill with us for a little bit. I know. Did you bring a laptop? Well, I'm here. No, I didn't. Oh, that, okay. yeah. <laughs> I have two iPhones though. Um, <laughs> Uh, that was a flex. Yeah. Uh, maybe we can meet some little villains. Yeah, yeah. I if you would love whitelist to. us, um, I have some Ethan yeah, MetaMask just sitting there. So yeah, we could chill our MetaMask <laughs> addresses right now to them. Um, little villains, what does the rollout look like? When are you guys going to launch? What's the supply? How much is it going to cost? Can you give us more details there? Yeah. So, so you know, we're looking to roll them out um, next month. How it will work is if you have a little hero, you'll be able to mint a little villain for free. Uh, so it's a benefit to the holders. Um, and then the supply that's left, if, pe if some people don't mint them, we'll, we'll sell those. We haven't set a price. We're sort of watching closely the market at the moment. And frankly, you know, there's so much volatility that I think we'll wait until the last moment that we can. Uh, He'll accept any currency, even Doge. It's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> at this point. Um, uh, so, you know, I think we'll, we'll take our time and look at the market and, and price it. The, the price point will uh, be lower than the, than the original mint price for, for the little heroes. Um, uh, but, you know, it's, it's sort of it's a reward for the holders, but we also want to have an opportunity to grow the community and expand the, 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 the holder space. So I think that's like a really interesting thing that happened. You, you mentioned volatility. When Little Heroes Mint, I believe ETH might have been at around 3K, something like that. So 0.4 at 3K, it's like, what, 1,400, 1,300 USD. Right. If we're denominating in US dollar, are you going to be denominating in US dollar for your next mint? Or are you going to be going with uh, based off of how much the Ethereum cost was then and for your first mint and how it will be for, your, for Little Heroes? Uh, no, I mean, they'll probably have a lower price point in Ethereum. Okay. Um, uh, which, you know. Hopefully, it's not too much lower than your dollars. All right, that's good to hear. Um, and then, how will you guys be rolling out the rest of it, right? So, if I own a little hero, yes, I can mint. But what about us? What about um, me and my friends and us plebs here in the audience? Uh, how do we get to get our hands on little villains? Will there be a yeah, public well, sale? The easiest way is get a little hero. Yeah. So you, now you get a little villain for free. Okay. Um, but uh, it, it, look, I mean, the reality is that if 100% of the Little Hero holders mint Little Villains, there will be no Little Villains left. Oh, so sell. there only will ever be that supply. That's exactly right. Interesting. Uh, we don't expect that to happen. It normally doesn't. There's a lot of people who are not paying attention every day to Discord. I've missed a lot of free drops. I had the opportunity to participate on other collections. I wasn't you and me both, attention. brother. Goblin's Town. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hate to um, see it. But uh, but we will make the the remaining supply available to the public. Gotcha. Okay. Well, this is good to know. And then right afterwards, that's when the training camp begins, and we could start sending our heroes and villains off to battle. I know. You, have you thought of a new verbiage for staking? We're calling it training camp. Training camp. Okay. Heroes training. Camp. Will training camp be available on mint day for little villains? It, it, yeah, absolutely. It'll be available right after. All right. Yeah, awesome. Right after the reveal. Cool. 
Um, Martin's, he's giving me signals, uh, good signals, I hope. Dun, 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 dun. Meg's got a question. <laughs> uh, come on, Mom. Um. I have a question. So I, I, hold, I hold 20, 22, or 25 little heroes. Um, and um, I have to say, they, they, they bring me quite a lot of joy. They, they're kind of awesome to look at, and I, and I, I know that I'm going to get my 25 little villains, which is pretty awesome too. Um, I'm also very, very lucky because I get a sketch from Edgar uh, for, uh, for, for, for being a, a whale holder, which is pretty cool. But um, I may have missed this, um, but I'm curious, with the new, the, the new collection you've done, you've taken a lot of like, great references from movies and, and characters. Um, but who is there a mega alpha in the uh, in in the collection that, that that you've drawn that is your favorite of all of the little villains? Mm, good question. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. You can you can get both. And can I have it? Okay. <laughs> Double the power. Um, uh, my my father uh, always. Um, write uh, science fiction novels science fiction yeah science fiction sorry and terror uh, books and i love uh, terror films uh, since i was a child and then my favorite uh, villain for me uh, maybe is uh, it's very difficult to say that Damien, for, for example, I, I have drawn Damien, the, the oh. real child, the prophecy yes. film. Um, when I was a child, uh, I see this film, I'm scared a lot <laughs> with this kind of boy. And I think uh, it's one of my favorite because uh, I think uh, all all my characters of the legendaries is, is legendary, have something uh, in my in my life. Uh, uh, sometimes I read the book, sometimes I show the film, sometimes uh, in my uh, my when I was a childhood, uh, sometimes inspiring me for something. Uh, it's very special when I make uh, legendaries. It's very special because it's like my biography of of my 18th generation, oh, and I love to good collector have this kind of 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 these legendaries because uh, I I hope to receive one because I don't know, but I going to try to maybe to try one T-shirt for me only. <laughs> it's the the yep. best solution for me. But because uh, I hope to uh, my holders receive this this uh, this legendaries and stay very funny. Oh, stay muy satisfechos con el trabajo. Satisfied. Satisfied with the work, uh, and I think uh, I'm going to try to 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 give more and more to this community, um, and I think uh, the NFT is the way to get a lot of things. I think is the pass or the access for a big community and not focus only in NFT. Because uh, NFT will be uh, your, your avatar, maybe your, like your avatar in the future to get a lot of access on my war events and, and projects that uh, little heroes will do. All right, beautiful. Well, Edgar, I hope you pull a legendary, um, and everyone else in here, hoping for uh, rare pulls. And uh, right now, we've got a little bit of alpha for you. So, if Andrew, if you if you will, we're gonna we're gonna play a little film, a little mini documentary, which is pretty awesome. It's like the advent of little villains. So, uh, okay. let's go. Los villanos a día de hoy. Nos rodea, están entre nosotros. Son esos políticos que corrompen, gente que destruye la naturaleza, gente que es violenta, 
gente que día a día solo piensa en hacer lo malo, gente envidiosa que solo piensa en lo peor para ti porque a ellos les va mal, en vez de intentar mejorar sus cosas, todo así, etcétera, etcétera. Y la sociedad, somos los títeres que quieren manejarnos. Eso sí que son los verdaderos villanos a día de hoy. No esos que vemos en los cómics que tienen máscaras, son calaveras y tienen esos superpoderes malignos. Esta sociedad demanda villanos. No sé por qué no podemos vivir en paz. No sabemos lo que es vivir bien al 100%. Siempre necesitamos algo negativo al lado para poder nosotros pensar lo que es positivo. La historia a día de hoy se contaría mucho mejor desde la perspectiva de un villano. Yo fui un niño muy gamberro y hacía muchas travesuras. Tenía cosas ingeniosas y ser un poco villano y rebelde era, era guay. Los villanos que yo estoy creando tienen esas actitudes que son como el yin y el yang del héroe, ¿no? No son esos superpoderes de, de tirar bombas, de supervillanos, de, de superfuerza como los superhéroes normales de los cómics, sino que respecto a la solidaridad que intenta inculcar los Lil Heroes, pues ellos intentan romper la sociedad, ser egoístas, ser más capitalistas, meter como quien diría mierda, ¿no? Alrededor de todos. Entonces, eh, salir el, el héroe y a, y a barrer otra vez. Mis villanos, lógicamente, a nivel de, de ver los visuales, eh, es, tienen que ser atractivos y me gusta que encarnar ciertos personajes de películas y de cómics para verlos caracterizados, los villanos y los monstruos. Yo creo que al final, cuando tengas un villano, tienes que pensar en el villano que llevas dentro, ¿no? Cuando te veas ahí reflejado. No se trata de ver a Darth Vader ahí en el espejo, sino ver tu propio villano, tu lado oscuro. Nosotros siempre tenemos un demonio dentro, que mucha gente lo tiene controlado, otros lo domina y acaba siendo un monstruo y una persona desagradable al resto de la sociedad, y otros completamente lo tienen anulado y solo viven para ayudar al resto. El villano es el personaje que la gente recuerda. Ten cuidado porque alguno puede convertirse en villano haciendo las cosas buenas o pensando que las hacen bien. All right, thank you everyone. Edgar, Daniel, Mitch, Michael. Amazing.